Hello everyone, welcome to Computer Science E7. This is lecture 10, Digital Cameras Continued. Um, so I think last time I got myself a little bit flustered and, uh, and, I, and I apologize if I uh, made things a little bit more complicated than they need to be. So I just want to take a couple of minutes and just quickly review some of the major concepts that we went over last time. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just to make sure that uh, I give myself a, uh, a good opportunity to make it clear about some of these, these important things that are very important to digital photography especially. So one of these things uh, that I'm referring to is this idea of having different sized sensors. So unlike film where you had um, very set predetermined sizes such as 35 millimeter film and smaller sizes that fit in, in much smaller cameras, we have a wider range of, of sensor sizes available in digital cameras today. And so even if, even if we ignore the compact camera market, which has in itself a very wide range of, of sensor sizes, um, digital SLRs as well, even though they look like 35 millimeter cameras of you know, film cameras of yesteryear actually have different size sensors of their own. And this causes uh, a variety of, of things uh, to happen to us as photographers. So first of all, we have a lens that can project a, sp a specific size image circle onto a sensor. But if we have two different size sensors, then we're going to capture different portions of that image circle. So we're essentially cropping out the sensor and we get this idea of a crop factor. Um, that can arise from having these different size sensors. So if we have two sensors, such as a 35 millimeter full frame one that's in red and a smaller APS-C sized or, or DX format uh, sensor that's in blue, um, they have the same number of megapixels and you use the same lens that's projecting this image of a mountain onto it, then you will it'll appear as though this smaller sensor is more zoomed in because if you uh, look at these two photos side by side, it, you know, when they're the exact same size on your computer screen, it will look like you have captured more of the scene in this uh, wider lens uh, or rather in this, in this larger sensor, even though it is the same size lens. So it has the effect of looking like you are using a longer lens on this smaller sensor that you have. Um, and we talked about even the comparison between not only uh, digital SLR size sensors, which is on the right here, and this isn't even a full frame sensor, um, compared to the size of the sensor in a typical compact camera, such as the one that can be found in the, uh, in the camera that can be uh, borrowed from the Church Street Lab, the Panasonic Lumix. And we talked about some of the implications of this. So if both of these sensors have the same number of megapixels, then that means that each pixel in the smaller sensor must also be smaller, otherwise you will have a, a disparity in the size of the pixels. And this also has uh, a, a couple of um, really important um, impacts to us as digital photographers. First of all, the smaller sensor will typically have a much smaller dynamic range. So whereas this, uh, the well size or the, the pixel size on the larger sensor is much bigger, so we can capture a much wider range of light the smaller sensor will capture much less. And so this uh, brings up the argument of uh, a couple of physical limitations that camera manufacturers come up to uh, and that we actually see as a result of, of some of the manufacturing processes. And that is that uh, for the same technological year or for the same technological generation, so if these two sensors were developed side by side, for example, and one is not considerably newer than the other, then the one that has the larger pixels will generally behave much better in terms of the quality. You will get better uh, signal to, uh, there's a, this concept of signal to noise ratio where the higher the signal, the, the less noise will be apparent in the particular image. And uh, the higher dynamic range we will have as well. And if we tie this into this last concept that we just discussed, if we have the same sized lens on in front of each of these sensors here, then what is going to happen is that this much smaller sensor will appear to be much more zoomed in. It's going to look like we have a much longer, longer lens on this camera than we do on this one. So to capture the same amount of the scene or to capture the same field of view, in other words, on both of these cameras or on both of these sensors, even more specifically, we have to shorten the focal length of the lens for this one here. We have to make it wider. So whereas we might have had something like a 
80 millimeter lens here for a nice portrait length, then we might have to get something like a uh, 12 millimeter lens for that same field of view on this sensor on the left. And this had an even further implication of altering our perception of the depth of field in a particular image uh, when, we, when we take a photo uh, from two different sensor sizes. And so um, I know that one of the things that I was, was talking about is that uh, last week I was saying that it's not necessarily in inherent to the smaller cameras that they have this larger depth of field. It relates actually to the size of the aperture. And that's certainly true. And there's a variety of implications again here as well that because this smaller camera has a smaller sensor, um, it must work harder, so to speak, in order to capture the same amount of light that this larger sensor does. So not only do we get this effect of, uh, of extra depth of field, but come with what comes with that is this loss in this signal to noise ratio. And this is the same thing that we were talking about before, where if we just capture, if we are capturing fewer photons onto this smaller sensor, just because it's, it's much smaller uh, itself compared to the area of the much larger sensor, then we get this loss in quality. But there's another way to think of this sort of depth of field myth, uh, as, as you might refer to it. Um, and that is that it really comes down to the, the physics and the optics of the, of the lens itself. So if you, are, um, if you are using a particular camera, it doesn't really matter what kind of camera, but if you have a zoom lens on it, one of the things that you may have noticed is that the longer the lens on that camera or the more you are zoomed in on that camera, the greater your ability to decrease the depth of field and get some very out of focus uh, portions of the scene in the, in the photo itself. And there's a reason for this, and that is that the depth of field is impacted by the focal length of the, of the lens itself. So the longer the focal length, then the less, uh, so the less depth of fields, or the more depth of field, the less depth of focus. So this region that appears to be in focus will be narrower for longer lenses. And this is the same thing that we talked about in the optics lecture. This isn't anything different than what we referred to before. If you want to get um, the appearance of you know, lots and lots of out of focus areas, you should use a longer lens or you should use a lens with a very, very large aperture. And that same sort of thing is happening to us here because in order for us to get the same field of view in this smaller camera that has a much smaller sensor, we have to use a much shorter lens than we do in this larger sensor, right? This isn't anything different than what we were talking about in this slide or even in this slide. The smaller sensor, in order to capture the same amount of information, has to use a wider lens. So it follows that if we are using a much wider lens or much shorter lens to capture the same field of view that we do for the larger sensor, then we are not going to have this, you know, as much out of focus regions in this smaller camera. So it's not really because the camera itself is smaller. It's a, it's a, it's the result of all of these physical properties coming together and impacting the way that we can take a particular photo. Now remember that one of the ways that we can trick um, the physics, so to speak. So we can't actually, of course, modify the laws of physics or anything like that. But because this larger camera has the capability to stop down its aperture to make it much, much smaller, which means that the depth of field will grow, then what we can do is essentially mimic that depth of field of the smaller camera by making the aperture the same size. So if we consider it a ratio of the sensor sizes, then we can make the, the, the aperture the same size and then be able to get the exact same uh, depth of field in both of these cameras. Now this example would break down if we were using a compact camera or a digital SLR that was much newer than the other because then um, one would behave or one would have better signal than the other, and so we wouldn't be able to make all of this math work out as well as it does in this particular example. And in fact, if, um, if you haven't read it, it's, it's an interesting, if dense read, uh, 
going through um, this uh, uh, Clark Vision website and, and where it discusses this exact thing when it references the, uh, the signal to noise ratio and this exact um, depth of field myth, as he calls it. Um, but um, it's, it is interesting, but it's also very tough to get through because it, it's bringing all of these factors into play very, very quickly. And so it's, it's something that uh, is worthwhile, I think, to read, but, um, but be prepared to, uh, to give it a few minutes to, uh, to be able to go through it. Now, one of the other things that uh, I mentioned briefly last time was the concept of ISO, or how we can simulate um, ISO sensitivity in uh, digital cameras. So even though digital cameras cannot actually become more or less sensitive, uh, we can trick it in a way. So you remember that we have these, these ideas of, of buckets for these pixels, where we can have, we have millions and millions of these small buckets that capture the light or that capture you know, falling water, to continue our analogy. And if we are to try to make it more sensitive to the amount of light that is presently there, then we can just double all of these values. So whereas before in ISO 100, we're able to fill up this bucket completely, in ISO 200, what was previously something that was only about this bright um, will now be multiplied by two. So it will appear to be white. So only having this bucket, this is now the entirety of the range within our, um, within our dynamic range and what is possible to capture uh, within the dynamic range for that particular ISO. So as we increase the ISO, we have fewer electrons that we are, we are capturing, or rather fewer photons that we're capturing that are being turned into electrons. And so we get this, this downgrade, so to speak, in the dynamic range of the camera. So this is just this is um, an explanation for why increasing the ISO, while it is a good thing for us as photographers, because we can then increase our shutter speed, for example, and be able to capture photos at shutter speeds that we just couldn't do at a slower shutter speed. It has the the downside of decreasing the quality of our image by some not insignificant amount. And so, if you remember, I showed that. Uh, DxO Mark website where they actually very um, they apply a lot of um, lab tests to a variety of cameras and actually show you the dynamic range that is available from each camera at all of these different ISO ranges and you can actually see that it, at its lowest ISO value all of these cameras have the the best dynamic range that's possible from that particular sensor then as you increase the ISO the dynamic range actually falls by about one stop. It's a little bit less than one stop because there's some other stuff going on here, but it does fall by about one stop. And the reason for that is that you are only capturing half the light, or you are only allowing yourself to capture half the light in each increase of the ISO. And so remember that because one stop of light is an increase or a decrease of, of, uh, of about to a factor of two. So one stop extra light means twice as much light uh, and likewise for the other direction as well, then this means that um, just by having one of these, we are losing one stop of available light information. Any questions on this so far? Okay, yes. That's a, yeah, that's a good question. So Canon and Nikon produce lenses that are for, that are specifically designed for the cropped sensors. And so uh, Canon has a line called an EFS lens, and I think Nikon's line is called the DX lens. Uh, and in each, so whereas here we have a lens, and I'm just going to use this as an example to, uh, to answer the question, we have a lens here that is designed for a full frame sensor, which produces an image circle that covers that entire frame. The, these EFS lenses or the DX lenses actually have a much smaller imaging circle. So whereas this will produce this entire thing, the, the EFS lens might only cover the smaller blue sensor. So there's now, the, it's important to note that the focal length that these lenses provide to you, whether it's 10, 
millimeters or 20 millimeters or something like that. That's actually the focal length of the lens. However, you still could apply the crop factor multiplication or the, mag the, the multiplication factor to figure out the field of view of that lens um, as it equates to a lens that were on a full frame camera. So in other words, um, I, I have here a, an EFS lens that's designed for camera and it's a 10 to 22 millimeter lens. So it's a wide angle lens. And this means that if you put it on, uh, so if you put it on a crop factor camera, it's going to have a very wide field of view. But in order for us to figure out what that same field of view would be on a 35 millimeter camera, I still have to mul multiply by the crop factor. So in this case, it's 1.6. So I know that this lens is approximately equal to a 16 to 35 millimeter lens on a 35 millimeter camera. Now, because the imaging circle is smaller here, that means that the lens doesn't have to be as large. So this lens tends to be a little bit smaller than the same sort of lens you would find for a 35 millimeter camera. So a, a 16 to 35 would probably be a bit larger than this lens as well. So um, even though the field of view appears to be the same, uh, there are other physical differences as well. And I guess another one is that sometimes you just cannot simply put these lenses on the full frame cameras because they have extra little protrusions at the back or something like that that will actually hit that will cause the mirror in the SLR camera to hit the back of the lens, breaking either the lens or the mirror or something bad likely to happen, which would not be a good thing. Good question though. Anything else? Okay. So we talked about just some of the different types or the major, major different types of uh, digital sensors that are available today for, uh, for us to use in digital cameras. So we have uh, p passive pixel sensors, the primary type is the CCD, so that's what you typically find in your compact cameras. We also have active pixel sensors, uh, and we have the major type there is the CMOS sensor, and you typically find that in the larger cameras like digital SLRs. And so I mentioned that um, the difference between the two is just it's, it's where a lot of the circuitry is applied. It's where the, the light gets amplified within it, and that's not really all that important to us. Um, but what is interesting is the difference, I think, between the two. So CCD is one of the most popular, if not the most popular sensor type available today. And that is because they are, um, they are found in compact cameras, in uh, digital cam, or rather in uh, camera phones, and a, lot of, and a lot of these devices where, um, where the noise, the amount of noise is really going to matter. So these use, these CCD imagers, use a little bit more energy than CMOS imagers, but they are a little bit, uh, they're a little bit cleaner than the, CMOS, uh, than the CMOS cousins. And this is a good thing for us because as you know, with the size of these compact cameras and camera phones today, the pixels are absolutely, absolutely minuscule. And so we need all the help that we can get to try to decrease the amount of noise within them. Um, so, and when another thing that we talked about from last time was this difference in, in the sensor size, how quickly uh, a, a pixel can fill up with light if it is a smaller pixel than if it is larger. So a larger pixel uh, will take longer to fill up with the same quantity of light than a smaller pixel, which is, this is just another way of showing you that these larger pixels tend to have greater dynamic range than these smaller ones. So a lot of this stuff that we talked about last week is, is kind of abstract. We're using this analogy of, of buckets and, and, uh, to try to make this a little bit more accessible. Um, and so now I want to make it a little bit more real with this. But don't worry, uh, you don't have to be an electrical engineer to understand what I want to say about this. And, and, it's, it, and it is this, it's relatively simple. So this is uh, a schematic of one pixel from a CMOS digital sensor. This is just one pixel. So imagine that this is now you know, several micron, microns wide by several microns high. And um, you don't have to know what all of this stuff does, but just realize that there's a photodiode right here. This is where the light comes and, and hits. And so that registers a voltage. It's how the, the camera knows that, there's, that there is some light that hits it. And then these devices that are right here, 
are actually transistors. So you may remember, uh, especially from the 90s, there, there was lots of talk about how transistors are getting smaller. It's the same sort of technology that you actually find in your computer processor. So transistors are what do the processing in a, in a computer. And what's important to note about this is that there's three transistors for every pixel. And so what, it, what these do, doesn't, it doesn't actually matter all that much. But just realize that we have, for this one pixel, a tiny area that is able to, to actually capture the light, and then a lot of other junk that's not capable of, of registering, of capturing light, but is still necessary for us to be able to receive that picture in digital format. So for all of our talk about how these larger pixels actually matter, how the, if you double the area, you're able to capture twice as much light than you are uh, in, in a smaller area, this is impacting us because we have this very small area that's actually capable of registering the light. So this is a very real problem. And this is something that um, manufacturers have had to try to combat. So if you were a manufacturer, how might we try to fix this sort of problem if we know that it's not possible to remove this circuitry? We can't make it any smaller, something like that. What can we do to try to, and here's a hint, focus the light that might fall on this entire pixel into this one little area? Any ideas? We have to focus the light. Tiny little lenses, yes. So we have this, this technology called micro lenses that exist on top of the actual sensor. So on top of the actual part that registers the light. And the job of these micro lenses is to focus the light that would have fallen on the entire pixel to focus it down to one small portion of the pixel where that photodiode or the small piece of circuitry that can actually register the light actually exists. So one of these, so I'm always talking about how newer technology can help improve the capabilities of these small sensors. And this is a very real example of one of the things that can do it. As these manufacturers have gotten better at creating micro lenses, they've been able to make them capture more light or focus more light onto smaller pixels. So even though we may get larger, or rather, more megapixels, therefore smaller pixels themselves, we are able to retain the same or even improve the signal that comes out of those pixels. And so um, this is just one reason why all of this stuff that, I, that I've been telling you up until this point, it is true, but it's, it's something that also, as you know, I mean, there's a lot of other factors involved that you have to consider. So it's not just that, OK, well, this camera has you know, fewer megapixels, and it's the same size, so it must have better, better, um, uh, better image quality than this higher megapixel camera. It's not necessarily true. There's, there's increases in technology, such as this micro lens, that can help us improve the image quality of a particular pixel. OK. so. We have this one pixel, and this is slightly more accurate of a depiction of a pixel than this bucket that I've been showing you up until this point. But you can see that there still is an analogy where this light has to go down this well, as it's called. It's called a sensor well that is surrounded by circuitry. So this circuitry here is all of those little doodads and funky looking electrical things that, have, that we saw in the previous slide. Um, and so the light has to travel down the well and into the photodiode itself in order to be registered. Now, um, there's something else that's important to note, and that is that uh, if we have a deep well that we can see, that, that as you can see here, then this micro lens has to be able to always focus the light straight down into the well. And this can be problematic if you're using, say, a very wide angle lens where the light doesn't always come straight into the sensor. It may come at sort of these oblique angles from the center of the lens. And so that's yet another thing where uh, we might get some problems uh, from lenses or from cameras. So if you're uh, familiar with uh, vignetting, for example, where the corner, 
of images get slightly darker. This is one reason why we might get uh, a vignette for a particular camera uh, and maybe not from a different one. Okay, but besides that aside, we have this photodiode down here that captures the light. And besides the fact that this is a leading question, would you believe me if I told you that photodiodes cannot actually capture color information? They are only capable of capturing grayscale information. And so I know I have to make that a rhetorical question because I basically told you that answer before I even gave it. So how do they fix this? If you can only detect black to white and not any colors, how would you try to detect color information with it? And there's a big hint right here. So manufacturers actually use different filters, color filters underneath the micro lens to filter out different colors of light. These tend to be called color filter arrays. And so we usually have three different colors associated with one of these color filter arrays. Um, and these, these filters are you're probably familiar with from our discussions of, of color as it relates to uh, computers and, and technology. So we have a red filter, a green filter, and a blue filter. And the whole point of these is to allow, for example, from the red filter, only the red light to be passed through. Or for the green filter, only the green light to be passed through. Similarly for the blue filter. This way, if we know that this particular pixel can only detect red light, then whatever variation we have in the darkness to the brightness of that red light, even though we can only detect sort of grayscale or a complete lack of color, then we will know how much red exists at that particular pixel. OK. Now, there's yet another problem that comes up because of this. And as you can see, these are pro it's problem after problem after problem with these digital cameras that engineers have had to fix. And luckily, they've, they've done a relatively good job with it. So you'll see that we have three color filter arrays, a red, a green, and a blue. But remember that the pixels themselves are square. So that means that we have, to, so if we have, let's say, a red pixel right here, right next to it, we might have a green pixel. Above it, we can have a blue pixel. What do we do for these other two? Well, could we put another green, another blue? How do we arrange it so that it makes the most sense? Because these pixels are square, how are we going to be able to arrange it so that we can get the most amount of information possible? And so we have the most common color filter array called the Bayer filter. And this is what most digital cameras actually use on top of their sensor is this arrangement of color filters over the, over the pixels themselves. We have a blue. We have, so you can consider it in, in squares of four here. We have a blue, a green, a green, and a red. Then right next to it, a blue, a green, a green, and then a red. So there's a predominance of green filters. Why? Why would we need more green than red or blue? Why is it more important? Right, that's exactly right. So when, from our earlier lecture, talking about how we view the world in terms of brightness or luminance, the green variation is the most important for us to be able to detect variation in luminance. So as, as you recall, the luminance calculation itself, the green was actually twice as important as the red, or even more important than the blue. So engineers use this to their advantage. They, made the majority of the pixels within the sensor, these green pixels, um, to be able to determine the brightness the, uh, to be the most similar as how we would see that particular entry. Now, keep in mind that there are more than just the Bayer filter array. And in fact, uh, uh, if you've used other cameras, you probably you might have used um, some of these other ones. So you might have, in addition to the Bayer filter, something like this uh, RGBE filter. So some manufacturers now swear by this, uh, by using an additional color, like an emerald color or a cyan color. Uh, 
which they claim will provide more information to the camera to be able to produce colors more accurately, to be able to produce the, the luminance more accurately or a variety of other things. Um, whether or not it actually works is another story. It's, it's up for debate. And I would argue that the Bayer filter, because it is so predominant, it is in just about every camera that's out there today, there's been a lot of research on it, so they've optimized it very, very well. So uh, you'll see a variety of other filters um, that are available. And um, I don't think, as with many things, that uh, you should believe the marketing speak if they are talking about, you know, especially Sony cameras. They're, they're the ones that have developed a lot of these emerald-based filters. They really push this and say, OK, we have this extra bit of color information that, uh, that these other ones do, and therefore we have better picture quality. Well, as with everything else, you have to do your research and see if that is actually true. It may not be. And, and um, uh, all of these other color filter arrays that exist um, have been used at some point or another. And, um, but for the most part, people just always go back to, to the Bayer color filter array. Now, as you can tell from this, there's yet another problem that we have to deal with. When we look at an image, that has been made by a digital camera, even if you look at it at 100%, completely blown up, you don't see one pixel that's only blue. Right next to it is another pixel that's only green. Right next to it is another pixel that's only red. No, you see this. They've recombined this color information back into the original color that was in the scene. So the yellows or the, the shades of, of brown or whatever other shades, violet, that existed within the scene are then reconstructed by the camera. And this is something that, um, that is, yet again, technology has been able to help improve over time. And it is this concept of demosaicing. And the whole point of this is to take each of all of the information that's provided to us by the sensor and try to recombine it back into whatever original colors existed in the photograph itself. Now, we could try to do this um, somewhat blindly. And we could say, OK, well, we have these, um, these blocks of four. So the, the blue, green, green, red, blue, green, green, red. We could just try to recombine each of those blocks. And then that is a pixel. So each of these four blocks creates one pixel. And each of the four blocks next to it creates one pixel, so on and so forth. But that's not very efficient. That decreases the amount of megapixels that we have in this particular sensor by a great degree, because now we were requiring four pixels to create just one pixel in the end result. And um, as a side note, um, you may notice when you're looking at uh, cameras and, and camera specifications that they're always talking about two different megapixel ratings. So the camera itself has like a 12 megapixel rating, and then they say, oh, it actually has like 11.5 effective megapixels. And the reason for that is this demosaicing that we're going to discuss right now. So what happens is that we have these four pixels that are next to each other. We can recombine them to get the color information from each. But then we can also use, we can just shift over by one pixel. And you see that we have exactly the same arrangements. It's just sort of flipped. So we still have the blue, the green, the green, and the red. But it's just it's right next door. So we can still get another piece of color information between those as well. So what a camera tends to do is that if we have a grid of these, of these 16 pixels, it will generate first the color information between these four, then these four, then these four, then these four. So we get four pixels out of that. Then it will go in between these major squares as well. So it'll do this one next. And then, let's see, so then th this one down here, and then this one, and this one, and then finally the one right in the center after it has all of this color information. So out of this, you'll notice that if we actually had this sensor that existed in a digital camera, this is a 16 pixel sensor, right? Because there's four pixels down, four pixels up, so we have 16 pixels total. But the end result is that we only get nine pixels of information out of it. We can't get color information out of just these two edge pieces, because it's only a green and a blue. It's, there's no red information or anything like that. So we're out of luck for those. So that is why, typically, you see in a digital camera effective pixel count that is less than the actual 
pixel count within the camera itself. So this is in, sort of an inconvenient problem for us to have. It's, 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 it's messy, it's, it's difficult to recombine this color information. As you can imagine, it could be error prone. So if we have um, some pattern that actually repeats quickly enough um, that it changes over each pixel, then you can imagine that as it recombines this information, it might get it wrong. And this is a problem that does, um, that does actually exist. And engineers again tried to correct this problem with a different type of sensor altogether. And so we actually have this other type of sensor that exists on the market today called a foveon sensor. And this, um, this, this sensor sounds great, and you'll, you'll understand why in just a moment. But unfortunately, it's so rarely used, and the technology is just so rarely seen that you really have to compromise in other areas to obtain a camera that has this sort of technology. But what does it do? OK, let's just take a look. So rather than have color filter arrays, where it has a pixel that can only detect one color, and then right next to it, a pixel that can only detect a different type of color, it uses the properties of silicon itself. If you remember, these sensors are, are made in, out of silicon wafers, if you remember from the, uh, the, uh, the How It's Made video from last time. And they analyzed how light is absorbed by silicon. And they found that as light travels through silicon, well, blue gets absorbed first and doesn't travel down very far. Then green gets absorbed next, and it only travels down maybe, you know, sort of midway. And red, the red light, tends to travel the farthest through this layer of silicon. And so they used this to their advantage. They would layer photodiodes, one on top of the other, the blue one being at the very top, and the green one being underneath it, then the red one being underneath that, so that at each pixel, there were three photodiodes that would capture each of the different red, green, or blue color information. And so remember that these still cannot detect color. It's just using this absorption idea uh, to try to figure out what color it is. So if it sees some information down here, then it knows that it's red. And then it'll see more information up here, but it can try to subtract the red out through a variety of means. And, um, we would be able to reconstruct the image. But the advantage to this is that every single pixel in the sensor has all three pieces of color information. So we don't have to do this really messy, really ugly demosaicing algorithm to try to reconstruct the original colors of the image. We are able to obtain all the colors at that pixel just by itself, just by having it right there. Now, typically in a Fovian sensor, um, there are many fewer, fewer megapixels. So I think you know, the most modern Fovian sensor in a digital SLR size is something like six megapixels or, or something like that, which doesn't sound like a lot. But the reason that this is good is that, remember, every pixel has three photodiodes. So it has essentially the same amount of information as an 18 megapixel camera. Because 18 megapixels, even though we have 18, we have three times as much information, every pixel is only getting a third of the amount of information as the Fovian sensor. So these Fovian sensors, even though they are much, uh, they have many fewer megapixels, the, the pixels themselves are able to be a little bit bigger. The images as well will be a lot sharper and potentially a lot more color accurate as well. But as you might be able to guess, there could be some problems with this. Any ideas what, what sort of problems we have with this particular type of sensor? Any guesses? So one of them might be noise in the color information itself. So keep in mind that this blue up here is getting all of the light information. And so we have to try to subtract out that additional light information that existed over here. So it could be problematic in that sense. We could get some color noise. And in fact, um, this is one of the major problems of Fovian sensors, is this, this color noise that exists, particularly in the blue channel.
Uh, and if you were to take a look at some of the, uh, the uh, sample images from, from cameras that use these Fovian sensors, and I think the major manufacturer is, is Sigma that uses these, uh, these particular sensors, you might notice that particular noise level. Now, one of the ways that um, this, besides having the advantage over Bayer color filter arrays, and that this doesn't have um, to do the demosaicing, another reason that this is good is that there isn't the filter on top of the, on top of the sensor itself. So we, we, every time, and keep in mind that every time we have something between where we're capturing the light and where the light is coming from itself, we are decreasing that amount of light. So light that's coming through this, this filter, it's probably being decreased by some amount. And so we don't have that filter, we don't have that filter and we don't have that problem in Foveon sensors. So this, this, I mean, it sounds great, but unfortunately it's just not, it has not been researched to the degree that um, these Bayer filter uh, sensors have. And so I think that now, even though Foveon sensors for a long time were doing very, very well, they just have not kept up. They just, they've not put the, the money behind it that's been necessary and the adoption has not been high enough to do it. But to try to convince you that this, this technology is actually something that's worthwhile, we can take a look at these series of images that pits the original Canon 5D, which was sort of the first full frame sensor that was accessible to, um, to the masses because it wasn't over $5,000 of, of a camera, compared to the Sigma SD14, which used a Fovian, um, a Fovian sensor instead. So even though, and this was a pretty popular comparison because um, I believe they, I don't remember if they were the same size sensors themselves, but the, uh, the Fovian sensor actually had a third the number of pixels as the 5D, and so it was, it was very good to compare the two. So because it had a third the number of pixels, it was also much smaller. So the, the actual file that you looked at was much smaller. However, looking at that file, excuse me, at 100%, it looked much sharper. There wasn't these jagged lines that the 5D would have, for example, because of this, this color filter array where it had to guess the movement of the color, or no, that's not right to say, but how the, the color was formed in the original scene. And particular problems for this are diagonal lines, as you can imagine. So we're only comparing pixels right next to each other. So there's two pixels somewhere around here where one of them was getting pink color information, and then the pixel right next to it wasn't. So it had to try to figure out what was going on with that particular piece of color. And so this demosaicing algorithm causes this sort of softness in the image, in the 5D image, that just is not present in the Sigma image. So even if we increase the size of this Fovian image, it still looks sharper. Like these lines, they look very smooth, very straight compared to that of the Bayer color filter array. Yes? Um, maybe it's just a, a different shot, but why is there more green hue in the background? Uh, so I think the difference in the background is just because of the placement of the cameras. So I don't remember exactly the <laughs> test conditions here, but if they had even the cameras sitting right next to each other versus actually you know, making sure they were in the exact same place, that would account for that difference. But even despite that, um, that difference in, in that slight difference in framing, I think that it still is interesting to see how the, the two sensors are able to form um, this, this particularly difficult section of color. And so I, uh, in this case, I don't think it matters that this is green as a background and this is blue. I think we would still see the same, um, the same result if the background colors were, were the same in both. And we can continue to see the same sort of idea, the same sort of problem where looking at the 5D here at 100% of this detail of this leaf, it doesn't look as sharp necessarily as the Sigma one. Now there are other factors of course involved like the actual lens that was used unless they use the exact same lens then there's another factor as well. But just looking at the theory behind how each of these two sensors should work, uh, 
these images sort of support that idea of what is happening from one sensor to the other. Now, I have been misleading you slightly in this comparison, and that is that when I told you about a typical uh, Bayer uh, uh, sensor, or typical sensor that uses a Bayer color filter array, I sort of led you to believe that this was it in terms of the sensor, that there's not much else that's going on here. But there is. So because we have this problem where we have very strict width and height definitions for each color, we have this problem that can occur with, with a sensor where, and just to remind you again, if we have a, um, a pattern that repeats very quickly, so maybe it goes from uh, like a pink to a blue to a pink to a blue, for example, like something like that, a very, very quick motion where uh, it's, it's literally one pixel wide. So in other words, the frequency of this is very, very high. Then it's going to smudge that color information. It's not going to be able to see that. It might look something like this muddy purple even, be, instead of looking like very well-defined straight lines between the two. So to combat this, engineers put yet another layer on top of these sensors, and it's called an anti-alias layer. So it's, it's what is called a, a low-pass filter, and what it does is it basically softens the image ever so slightly, so that these very high-frequency changes just do not occur from one pixel to another. So when I show you that this image in the 5D is a little bit softer. It's not necessarily because of the sensor or because of this demosaicing algorithm. It's because in order to combat this problem that the demosaicing algorithm has, we have to put a filter on top of it to soften it slightly, ever so slightly. And you see that right here. You see the slight softness that can occur with these particular cameras um, in this exact sample. Now, to put a more real idea behind this, I can show you yet another example of what might happen. So let's say we have, we're, we've taken a shot of, I think this is a, somebody's foot, and it was like where the jeans meet the, the shoe. And the jeans, as you can imagine, have this very, very fine texture. And it was small enough that every pixel it was changing from a blue to a white to a blue to a white. And that is reproduced well in this Fovian sensor, because it just so happened that, this, that the frequency of this particular pattern matched that of the, of the pixels. It was able to be resolved by the sensor itself. Now, if we didn't have an anti-alias filter on top of a Bayer, uh, a Bayer color filter array sensor, we would get something that looks like this. So yes, it does muddy the, the details a little bit, but you get, do you see this sort of color banding problem where it alternates between this red and this white and this blue, it's because it's of this change, it's happening in every single pixel, and this demosaicing algorithm doesn't know how to handle it, doesn't know what it's looking at, so it's making a guess. And you get this, this weird maze-like, um, this weird maze-like problem and this uh, weird color problem that can exist. So this is a problem, and to combat this, this is where they put that anti-alias filter on top of the sensor. So putting the Bayer, fil the, the Bayer sensor with a low-pass filter or an, an anti-alias filter, it does smooth out the details so that it, it softens it a little bit, but we remove that really strange maze-like coloring and a lot of the weird effects that can happen with these very high-frequency details within this particular shot. So we have removed one, objectional, one objectionable quality of the image and just put in another one. And so arguably, making it softer is a lot better because unless you really, really understand this, um, then you're probably going to look at these images and, and given two cameras that are side by side, one of them where you see this and one of them where it just looks a little bit softer, you'll probably elect the softer one because it's just not as difficult to correct, frankly. It's not as difficult to fix. Um, uh, later on in software, and it's not something that you want to have to, to deal with. Okay, let's just take a quick five-minute break, and when we come back, we'll continue talking about sensors.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. So before the break, we were talking about the various layers that actually go within the sensor themselves. And one of the topmost layers that exist is this anti-alias or low pass filter that is on top of just, just about every digital sensor that's out there today because most every sensor is a, um, a Bayer, it's a, it has a Bayer color filter array. And so I just wanted to mention quickly that if you actually open, uh, if you lift the mirror on your SLR or you maybe stupidly open up your compact camera and try to look at the, the guts within it, um, then one of the things that you will see is the sensor within the camera itself. But I do want to mention that what you're looking at, the very top layer, isn't the actual sensor, it's not the micro lenses, it's not anything like that. It is actually this low pass filter. It's this anti-alias uh, filter that exists at the very top of the sensor. So every time it gets dusty or you are cleaning it or touching it in some way, you're manipulating that filter. So this doesn't mean that it's um, any better to scratch it or, you know, uh, spill something on it or something like that. It's just useful to note that you're not actually touching the raw electronics itself. You're, you're touching a glass filter that exists on top of, of the sensor. And uh, if something happens to your, to your camera, say while you're cleaning it or something, you may uh, get lucky when you send it in for repair and be able, they might just be able to replace that one filter. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be cheap, but it still might be possible to salvage um, salvage your particular camera. Now, we have been talking about these two major types of, of uh, sensors. So we have the, the typical CMOS or CCD sensor that has a Bayer color filter array on top, or there's also the Fovian sensor that, uh, that is capable of capturing all three of these primary colors, so to speak, in one pixel. But uh, manufacturers have even experimented with different types of sensors as well. So for example, Fujifilm, uh, they came out with this particular sensor that looks a little funky, but this is one pixel right here, and it has actually two photodiodes per pixel. And so one of them is a very large, high sensitivity pixel, which is capable of capturing like the shadows and mid-tone regions. And then there's a much smaller pixel, where because it is smaller, it is, cap it is capable of, of having a lower sensitivity, so it's able to capture a lot of the highlights, a lot of the detail in the highlights. And what Fujifilm claimed from this particular sensor was that it was able to combine the information from both of these pixels and get even better dynamic range out of a particular scene or out of, out of a particular image. And where this was most apparent and most interesting was in its ability to recapture details lost in an overexposed region. And um, a lot of reviews, if you, if you read some of, these, uh, some of these reviews, and I don't actually know if they've been keeping up with this, but this was popular even up until, um, I think even last year, um, it did seem to work to a certain degree. They were able to get one stop, maybe two stops of additional information out of, uh, out of this camera than they were out of a typical, um, out of a typical camera that doesn't have these two uh, sensors. And so this is an interesting way, I think, that uh, uh, camera manufacturers would be able to combat blowing out highlights, for example, if they wanted to, to try to do that, was, would be to have two of these separate photodiodes. Okay, so there's a variety of sensors out there, like we've, like we've mentioned. And of course, the, the most popular ones in compact digital cameras, just to reiterate, are the, the CCD sensors that use a Bayer color filter array on top. Digital SLRs tend to have CMOS sensors uh, that also use a Bayer color filter array on top. Um, and a lot of this information, after we capture this data, we put it on the camera or we, we put it onto our computer, we, we can view this data or we view this data as an image, but we also see or we can see, I suppose, a histogram as well. And so we spent a while, an, an entire lecture, in fact, talking about the histogram. So just as a quick review, what are the different types of histograms that we can have? Luminance, color, RGBs, and then we could also split them into the separate red, green, and blue color channels. But typically, a camera will have maybe luminance or RGB or colors, maybe if you're lucky, all three. Um, and so we can use this histogram to get an idea of the, the variation or the dynamic range uh, 
within the scene. And I had always mentioned this, but I never really formally described it. So let's say that we have this particular scene right here and we capture it with our digital camera and we look at the, at the histogram and it looks like this. So you might be able to see something kind of wrong with this image. I mean, it's an okay image. It's, it's, it's pretty good, except that it's just very low in contrast. There's not very high range in contrast. And so what you were looking at in the histogram is an RGB histogram, just to give you an idea. But what you are seeing is the dynamic range of the scene is just, is just too low compared to the dynamic range possible from the camera. So we could increase the contrast and, and uh, get, you know, make this look a little bit better. But let's say that we had a much smaller camera available uh, and so it has smaller pixels and its dynamic range isn't as high. And so we capture this same image with it. We take a look at that picture and it looks like this. So immediately you're like, wow, this looks really good. It's really, it pops out and you know, has lots of good color information. But there's a downside to this and you can see that it's blown out a lot of the color information at the high and low ends. So the dynamic range of this scene, even though it's the same scene, is now too high for this particular camera. So um, keep in mind that this is um, exaggerated. So if you actually have two cameras side by side, it's probably not going to look like this. But you can, of course, adjust this lower contrast image to have a higher amount of contrast within it. But there's a downside to this. And uh, I mentioned this before, but I don't, again, I don't think I actually did anything to show you. So let's say I have an image that looks like this. And just to give you an idea, this image was taken with a compact camera. And let's say that, I th uh, you know, it looks okay. It has some interesting contrast within it already. But let's say that I really wanted to go overboard and increase the contrast even more. And what I want you to pay attention to is this change in the color of the sky, the gradient that exists here. So as I increase the contrast, it is, of course, increasing the contrast, as you can see. But just to show you, so just to show you these maximums, so this is very low contrast. This is very high contrast. If you can see, there's this sort of defined line in the difference of the blue. So there is this, this lighter blue and then a step to this darker blue and then a step to this black. And so by increasing the contrast of this image too much, we have gotten, we run into this problem called posterization, where we can actually see, we don't, we no longer have these smooth gradients. And again, the, the, this projector loves to really increase the contrast on it. And so if you looked at this image on a computer screen, it's even more exaggerated where you can see the actual steps in the, in the color gradation. So that is generally a bad, bad thing. That's not something that you want to do. And so we discussed how um, having a wide tonal range, so having lots of intermediate values between this sort of lighter blue and this darker black, having more values in there would allow us to increase the contrast and retain a smooth gradient within them. And that is something that uh, is, in order for us to really discuss and get down into the nitty gritty, we again have to talk about a little bit of bits and bytes. Okay, so a bit, as you remember, is just a zero or one. Remember, a byte is just eight bits, or it's 256 different values that, that, are, that are possible uh, within one byte. Um, <clears throat> and so if we have just one bit, we have two different values. If we have two bits, we have four different possible values, so on and so forth. Now, what happens in the sensor itself, if you remember from that uh, electrical diagram that I showed you before, the sensor itself is not actually a, a digital device per se. It's actually an analog device. As photons fall onto a pixel, it increases the voltage of it. And so it's, it's an analog device. So we have to try to convert a voltage into this, this digital language, into this binary output. So we could have a voltage somewhere from zero volts to represent something that's completely black, for example, or an empty bucket. Or we could have a maximum of one volt, for example, which would represent you know, the complete presence of light, so it's completely white. And now we have to try to convert 
that information, so keep in mind that it could be anywhere in between here, so 0 0.01, 0 0.02 volts, anything in between, we have to try to convert that into these values that can be represented by binary or by a computer so that we can then view them on screen. And so we have this device in the camera called an ADC or an analog to digital converter and that is its job is that it is supposed to read the information or the, the information provided by the sensor is input into the ADC and then out comes this value that represents that level of voltage at that particular pixel. Okay, so let's say that I have a slightly, ever so slightly more than half full pixel here and it's about 0.55 volts. So keep in mind that if we have an 8-bit uh, ADC, that means that the output at every pixel will be 8 bits of information. So that means that we could have 256 different values at each pixel. Which sort of makes sense because as you recall, a red channel could have 256 different values, a blue channel could have 256 different values, so this would sort of make sense for us because then we would be able to do something with this digital information. So keep in mind that that demosaicing and all of those algorithms happen after it's been converted to digital. So we have to convert it to digital first and then we can do whatever it is we need to do with this information or even just view it on our screen. Okay, so if we have 255 different values here, then we could assume that zero would be you know, black or completely empty and 255 would be completely full. So with this in mind, we have something that's about ever so slightly more than half full that maps to this value of 140. And then the job of this analog to digital, to digital converter is to convert it to a binary number, which is that. So that binary number actually represents 140 um, in, in one byte of information or in eight bits. Okay, so keep in mind that we are able to have an 8-bit sampling here, 256 different values. But if we think about what this means, this means that if we have um, an 8-bit ADC and we have an analog sensor that is also, or that is capable of about 8 stops of dynamic range, then that's, then that's okay. Or even if we have a sensor that's capable of about 7 stops of dynamic range, then that's okay too. And that, the reason that this is okay is that, um, keep in mind that it's a doubling or a halving of all of this information that represents one stop. And so if we start at one and we double eight times, we get 256. That's why this is an eight bit ADC is because we have basically eight stops of information that's possible within this. So imagine though that we have this new fancy sensor that's capable of a lot higher dynamic range, maybe something along the lines of 10 stops or even 12 stops, then what we need is a higher, an ADC that has a higher uh, sampling. So one that has maybe 10 bits or 12 bits of information so that we can represent all of the information from that sensor in digital format. So if we have a sensor that has too much dynamic range, that has too, uh, too much dynamic range for the, the ADC, then it's just, not, it's just not going to work out very well. We have to throw out some information either at the high end or at the low end in order to be able to represent it in the digital format. So what you see these days then, um, or, and, okay, so just to put it in a, in a different perspective, let's say that our sensor had uh, 10 stops of dynamic range, which is very plausible out of a digital SLR, this means that we could have 1,024 different levels of, of gray, for example. So we could have, uh, we could have you know, black and then we could double it, that's another stop. Keep doubling, keep doubling, keep doubling, and we get you know, about 1,024 different levels of information, whereas our 8-bit sampler is only able to get 256. So we're losing a lot of the data, about three quarters of the data. So to combat this, one of the things that we see is a higher sampling rate out of digital cameras. And so, so you know, for a while there, 12-bit sampling was pretty popular, and now manufacturers are moving towards 14-bit sampling. And this may not sound like a lot of 
extra detail, but keep in mind that every time you add a bit, you're doubling the amount of information. So whereas 8 bits was capable of 256, uh, 10 bits is four times that, so 1024, then double that again, it's 2048, double that again, is 4096. So 12 bits of information is capable of 4096 different levels of information. And so um, keep in mind that there's even some other problems here as well. So if we have a simpler system, such as this earlier one that has you know, a, a lower dynamic range and a lower 8-bit uh, sampler from the, the analog to digital converter, uh, keep in mind that we could have some other sampling errors as well. So let's say that I just showed you as an example here, we go from 0 to 1 volt, and I had about two uh, decimal points of precision. But let's say that the camera is actually capable of, of more precision than this, what we do when we map it from this, from this sort of analog form, this decimal point form, over into this integer that's you know, very rigid, we can get this sort of quantization error. So it might have to round up or round down ever so slightly. And this is yet another problem that, um, that can exist in this sort of conversion. It's an, it allows from an extra little bit of noise, for example, and having so few quantities for it to choose from makes this posterization problem even easier because we just have so few values between absolute black for this camera and absolute white for this particular camera that there's just, it's just easy for it to, um, to have uh, this posterization problem if we need to increase the contrast within it. So battling this, we can increase the sampling of the ADC. So having so this is sort of the new thing, is that having a, a big uh, ADC with 12 bits or 14 bits, and we haven't, I don't think we've seen 16 bits yet, but I bet that's going to be on the horizon. That's sort of the new thing, because now we have a lot more data to be able to work with, and that means that it's smoother variation from what is absolute black to what is absolute white. So we have this greater latitude to work with. So, to put this into perspective of, of, these, of this terminology that I've mentioned before, increasing the sampling in the ADC increases the tonal range of the, of the particular sensor. Because if we have a sensor that is capable of the same dynamic range, and we have, we're able to sample more you know, finer grain details within it, then we have smoother levels, smoother grays within the same levels. So this really serves dual, this, this serves a dual purpose for us. If we have a fancy sensor that is capable of very large dynamic range, then we, all, we do need a large um, sampling ADC to be able to get all of that information out of it. But also if we have a large ADC, then what we can do is get finer grain detail out of a smaller dynamic range sensor as well. So it's sort of a win-win to have a higher sampling. However, the, the downside to it is that because just increasing the sampling rate by one bit means that we're doubling that information, we do have twice as much information to have to deal with now. So whereas before we were dealing with, uh, even recently, 12-bit ADCs and now we're moving to 14-bit ADCs, doesn't sound like a big change, but it's four times as much information for the same image to be able to process. And so we have it's, it's, it's harder for these cameras to process it. And um, some cameras actually, the end result, I believe you can actually choose between how much sampling you want. In some advanced cameras, you might be able to pick between 12-bit or 14-bit. And if you choose the higher one, it actually has to slow the camera down to try to keep up with the quantity of data that's available. And so it's, it's a trade-off. Do you want a slower camera but have more values to have to work with? Or do you want a faster camera at the expense of some image quality. Now, yes? So just a quick comment. So um, if the processor is the limiting factor, um, it's a rhetorical question, why not just go with faster processors? You know, the music business eight years ago, eight bit was common today, four bit is common. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, 
one answer is to throw more processor speed at it. But the downside to that is that in digital cameras, we're limited by battery capacity. And so we have to create small, power-efficient processors that are not only fast at being able to process this information, but also not very power-hungry. Because we're already pretty limited. Even, even in SLRs, um, I mean, professionals, even all of us, even if we're not quite professional, we like to, have as, to be able to get as many shots out of the camera as possible. We like to go farther between recharges. And so we have to, if we have a, more batteries in it, then yes, we could have more processors, but then it increases the weight. So as with everything, it's, it's a trade-off. Um, but the other problem is the expense. So um, these camera manufacturers tend to design and create their own processors uh, to, to actually process the images inside of the camera, and that costs some money as well. And so um, uh, while we could have maybe fancy 24-bit processors that are uh, capable of you know, huge sampling rates here, um, it's just going to cause a problem for us in camera. But then also on the computer, because JPEGs, for example, are limited to 8 bits of color information. And so having more color information, we still have to shove it down into 8 bits of color information for JPEG. Um, and this is something we'll talk about. We could still store this data in the raw format, but even to this day, we don't see 16-bit processing still isn't very popular these days, even now um, with, with the modern, very fast uh, computers that we have. So it's, it's just for this reason, I think we'll get there eventually to 16-bit, maybe even 24-bit, but it's going to be a while first, I think, before we reach it. Now, keep in mind that um, these sensors, as more light fills up the sensor, um, we have more data, well, no, we have, we have higher values within this data to have to work with. So if we double this, so, okay, so if we double this value, then you can imagine that we're going to overexpose it. That means that we have one stop more light, right? Does that make sense? So let's go the other way. Let's say that we have an absolutely full sensor, so we've blown out that highlight, essentially. And then let's say that we change the stops on our camera by one. So now what was previously this one volt, you know, super bright pixel, is now half a volt of information. So keep in mind that this ADC doesn't do anything fancy. It just does a straight mapping. So this results in something called sensor linearity, so that every time we double this, the amount of, of photons in here, we're also doubling the value in the digital output. So what does this mean? Well, the, the very highest amount of values, so the first, the first half of values represents one stop of information. And, and this makes sense if you think about it, because going back here, if we change, if we have something that's very, very bright, and we change it by one stop darker, now it's half as much. So if you think about this, that means that these stops, the first brightest stops of information in the camera have the most values to represent them. Because every time you have the values, so we've gone from you know, that full bucket or one volt of information at 495 to half a volt or that half bucket down to 248. And then we keep having this and having this, we have fewer and fewer and fewer values to work with as it gets darker. Does that make sense? OK, so this is a very important point that um, we can have, sure, we could have a lot of stops of information that's capable of being registered by the sensor itself and then to be converted to this digital format by this ADC. But really, what's most important are these brightest few stops. They're going to have the most values within them to represent the levels, uh, the, the, the different levels of brightness within that particular scene. So every time we double the photons, we're doubling the value. So why is this good? Well, one thing is that we, it's very easy to determine the brightness. If you were just reading the raw data off of the sensor, you could figure out exactly how much brighter one pixel is compared to another. You know exactly how many more photons fell on one pixel compared to another. But this does have a few downsides. That is that 
again, I mean, it is nice that these, these first few stops have so many, has, has so much information, but all these lower ones here, I mean, they get shafted, really. I mean, if we have 10 stops of information that's capable in, of dynamic range from this sensor, and we have the first three stops that are available from 500, the value 512 all the way to 4096, that means that the remaining seven stops have to battle for the remaining 512 values within the sensor or within that image. And that's, I mean, that makes it sort of conceptually weird for us, but there's yet another problem, and that is that our eyes don't view scenes linearly. When we look at, at, at a scene, we don't see something that's twice as bright. We don't see it the same way that this sensor does. Something that's twice as bright, we don't have, it doesn't register to us as being twice as bright. We actually have this, this notion where the brightest portions of the scene are sort of compressed and they all sort of look bright to us. The darkest portions of the scene are sort of compressed and they all sort of look dark to us. And then it's really these sort of middle tones that have the most importance to us. And in order to get around this, we have to apply something called a tone curve to this linear data. So this data is very, very linear. So this, the bottom most stops, every increase of, uh, by a factor of two in this information means we are getting one more stop of color information. But because our eyes do not view the world that way, we have to apply a trick in the camera or on the computer in order to make the scene or to actually make the data appear on screen as we would have seen that particular piece of data. So we have to apply this tone curve. And, that is, and this is a representative of sort of a, of a typical curve. And the benefit of this tone curve is twofold. So first of all, we can change this linear representation of the data into something that more closely mimics how we would have viewed the scene. Now, the other benefit is that we can use a tone curve to try to map down the huge amount of information provided by the, pic by the sensor. So remember that if we have a 12-bit analog to digital converter, that means that we're going to have about 4,000 or so values uh, produced by that sensor. But remember that the JPEG files that are output by just about every camera and that we share on the internet are not 12-bit. They are 8-bit. So we only have, we have to map down this 4,000 different values down to about 255 different values. So this tone curve is important to us, not just because we're not just going to dumbly divide everything by 8 or something like that, um, 16, to try to get this amount of information into an 8-bit JPEG, but we're also able to map how our eyes would view it. So let's break this down. So this is the sensor output. So keep in mind that um, this is what this, the, right after the data comes out of the sensor and then is converted to digital by the analog to digital converter, it is produced into this data right here. So if we have a value that is zero from that, from that process, then it's going to be completely black. If we have a value that's 4,096, then it's going to be completely white. And then we have you know, half of this, of the stop, is going to be the first stop, the highest stop of color information for that particular scene. And, but this is where that sort of, um, that how this, why this feels so unintuitive. This is where it becomes intuitive again, using this tone curve. So notice this tone curve. This highest stop of information from 2,000 to about 4,000, if we look up, it's very, very flat. So it's not given a lot of values in this range of 0 to 255. So this is what is output by the camera into the JPEG or by your screen, something like that that is just shown on your computer screen. So a value of 0 here would appear to us as black. So value of 255 there would appear to us as white. But because it doesn't make sense to our eyes or to our brains that we have a whole stop of information up here in this top half, we can flatten this curve and say that, OK, well, maybe only the top 
say, let's see, it's hard for me to go across the edge here. So it looks like it's about the top five values or so are provided to this topmost uh, stop of information. And what happens as we go down this curve is that these intermediate stops, so these stops that represent the sort of gray end of this particular scene, are given more importance in the output. So in other words, what we're saying is that, so this stop of information from 1,000 to 2,000, that has slightly more importance because now it is mapped to a value of, of say, 175, somewhere from 175 to about like 230 or something like that. And then it sort of follows suit for these other, um, these other stops that exist down here as well. And by the time we get down to the very dark end of the, of, the, of the stop or of the range, then we are giving it very few values within the image itself. So this matches how we see. So it, what, it, what it does is it compresses the highlights and the shadows, and it extends the mid-range. Yes? So is this tonal curve only relevant when translating 12-bit data into 8-bit? That, no, it is, it is relevant every time. So I'm using um, the 12-bit to the 8-bit uh, just as an example. But it must apply a tone curve even if the, the output from the sensor is 8 bits as well because the sensor is linear. And so in order for us to view it, so if this was 8 bits instead, we still must apply a tone curve so that the output image looks how we would have perceived the C. So th this is just representative. But this tone curve could also be used to figure out how to flatten all of these values down into the smaller, the smaller values allowed by an 8-bit uh, file. OK, everybody with me so far? So the tone curve is really, really important. Now, um, something that's interesting is that this tone curve tells us something about the posterization that can occur within an image. So we used to have in the original sensor output, all of this data that existed within the scene. And then we have to map all of this data down into just 255 different values. It just, it's, it, we're sort of cheating ourselves. We're losing a lot of the data that existed. And this is one of the primary arguments for using raw over JPEG, is that you're able to retain all of the bits that were provided to us by the sensor, we can later on apply our own tone curve. We can do whatever sort of processing we want. We have all of that extra information. We can apply a tone curve layer. And one of the, something that's important to note is that modifying the tone curve actually modifies how contrasty or how not contrasty a particular scene is. Uh, you could try to map more, I'll come back to this slide in a second. You could try to map more values um, if you wanted by maybe flattening the tone curve a little bit so that you get more values in sort of the important regions of the middle, the, the sort of mid-tone regions of it. So you would get less contrast by having a sort of flatter, uh, a flatter curve right here. Or you could increase the contrast by having a sharper curve. It really doesn't matter. Um, how you want to do it. The point is that by using raw, you have all of those extra bits of information. And again, one additional bit is doubling the amount of data. So 8 bit to 10 bit, is, it's not an, inco an inconsequential jump. You are getting four times as much data. And then another four times uh, jump to 12 bit, and then yet another to 14 bit. So you're really uh, having a lot more data to work with when you have the raw file out of your camera. Now, there are downsides to the raw. That is that they are all pretty much proprietary. Even uh, the raw files from one camera to another from the same manufacturer are not the same. They're usually almost always different. So you usually have to have some sort of proprietary software to try to open that particular file. And this is bad for us if we want to try to persist our files. Uh, I'm sure. This has happened to all of us, where we have just opened up um, 
old photo albums from our family and you know even though those those photos are decades old we can still open those photos and view them and enjoy them and can the same thing be said for these raw files where only specific pieces of software can open them what's going to happen decades from now when our computers no longer exist when that software no longer exists how are we going to be able to open this 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 uh, one file and this is um, an argument um, to standardizing this type of data. So JPEG is a very, very popular format. I would argue that it has longer staying power because, I mean, just about every image on the internet today, you need to have some software that understands JPEG in order to view it. So that means that this, this sort of, this, uh, this processing, the, the ability to open it, because it is standardized, it will probably persist for longer than, than a raw file will. Um, so you, it's again a balancing act. You might be able to get the best image quality out of a RAW file than you would out of a JPEG, but you then lose this, this portability, being able to move it from one computer to another, being able to open it on one computer that doesn't have this uh, proprietary software. Now the other downside to it is that you do have to process it. So in order to make it into a JPEG file format, you have to open it in some software that understands it and then export it as a JPEG. So you might be able to just use the defaults, but usually that's sort of silly. You might as well just use the JPEG in that case anyway. So if, if you do any sort of processing to it, you, I mean, you have to re-export it as a JPEG file. Now there's some interesting things. Um, I mean, with those disadvantages, uh, do come some advantages to this file format as well. So the white balance, for example, and this is something that we'll talk about more in the color lectures, it's not set in the raw file. You can actually adjust it with minimal impact or virtually zero impact on the end result, whereas it's very, very difficult to try to have to adjust the white balance or, or the, how the colors appear in your image in a JPEG file. And one of the reasons for that is this posterization problem. If you try to change the colors too much, you will probably get some posterization in one or more color channels. Uh, another thing is this tone curve. You're able to reapply the tone curve in the raw file to make it more contrasty, less contrasty. And because you have many more times the amount of information in the raw file than you do in the JPEG file, you just have smoother gradations. You'll arguably be able to get better output out of your raw file. Now, uh, the compression, how they compress the format, the raw file is generally losslessly compressed, which means that it, it is as much information that you can possibly get out of that camera. Um, as soon as you apply some lossy compression to it, as you remember from our discussion of file formats, you're throwing away some data that you will never be able to retrieve again. So it's useful on, one, on, on the one hand to archive raw files because then you're able to go back and reprocess them with as much information that you had at the, at the scene itself without you know, actually retaking the photograph. But the downside to that is that if you wait too long to reprocess these, you may not be able to open them again. Now, um, Adobe has actually tried to combat this with a, uh, a standardized raw file format called the digital negative or the DNG file format. And they do have converters that you can download and it converts your proprietary raw file into a standard DNG file that is then uh, able to be opened by a great many uh, um, uh, quantity of, of uh, applications like all of Adobe's um, processing, image processing suites. Um, but the downside to that is that you do lose, I mean, you will most likely lose some information in the raw file, and not necessarily the, um, the data itself that actually makes up the image, but probably some of the metadata. So some of the data that your, that your camera stores in the file that you don't actually see, like the uh, exposure information or some information about the lenses that were used, the camera that was used, that may or may not persist when you convert it to this more portable format. So again, it's one of these things that you just have to make a decision and stick with it. Um, well, I guess you don't have to stick with it. You could change, but um, it, is, it is a problem that we do have to deal with as digital photographers. Now, um, yet another downside to RAW is the speed. It usually impacts the speed of the camera itself. 
So because it has to save files that are much larger in RAW versus JPEG. So in this camera, for example, it makes RAW files that are 25 megabytes in size. And if, if so, just to give you an idea, a CD is capable of holding about 700 megabytes. So it means that I can only hold about 28 raw images on one CD, which is, it's ridiculous. And it's, it's abhorrent how much hard drive space I have to have when I take some images. I have to have this massive memory card that's expensive, you know, an eight gigabyte memory card. I mean, is that even necessary? It's huge, but it only takes, it only stores like 300 pictures or something like that. So I can only go a day with, all right, end of my rant. Anyway. <laughs> So these raw files are huge. You have, you have to find some way of storing them, of backing them up. Whereas JPEG files, because they are compressed and because they have much smaller bit depth, they are much smaller as well. So these same files might be on the order of maybe four megabytes, maybe five megabytes. It depends, of course, on the megapixels that your, that your camera contains. Now, on the other hand, because this raw data is the I mean, it's what it sounds like. It is the raw data that comes off of your camera's sensor. Usually there's advances in these algorithms, like this demosaicing algorithm, for example. You doing it in your computer, you might be able to get better quality than you would by relying on the, the processors that exist inside of your camera. So you might, again, be able to recover some of that information. So again, it's, it's one of these things you just have to, to decide what to do and, and be able to do it. And I highly recommend using raw files uh, for, for photos that, um, let's see, so unless, I guess, un unless there's snapshots, I think, so unless there's something that you just want to take and just very quickly send out to some friends or something like that, maybe it's a photo that uh, you want to be able to work with or be able to post or be able to uh, publish or something like that, then generally you will want to take that photo in the raw file format because you will have the greatest number of options in the end. So again, it's really up to you, uh, except when it comes to this class, we do recommend and, and make you use the raw files for, for a number of assignments. Now, there is, a, uh, there is something that I do want to mention that is a result of a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of this idea, uh, a lot of these ideas that we've talked about up until now, such as this sensor linearity and this idea of, um, of being able to access as much data from a raw file as possible. And that is this notion of something called exposed to the right. And the reason for this is that the theory here is that the, the, the top two or three most stops of information in an image contain the highest number of values that you will be able to get from that scene. So if you have a scene that is relatively low in contrast and you are not at risk of uh, overexposing the scene or overexposing something, then what you should try to do is increase the exposure slightly and do this only for raw file formats, not in JPEG, because you're not going to be able to recover some of this data. But if you increase this, this, uh, the exposure ever so slightly, maybe by a, even a stop or a third of the stop, for example, then you will get the most amount of data that is possible because you are providing as many photons as possible to these, all of these values that exist in the upper three or upper two stops within the file. And this has to do with that sensor linearity because the sensor records this data in a very linear fashion where we double the amount of photons and that doubles the value itself. That means that these highest stops um, available to us actually will contain the most amount of information. So if you've already overexpose something, then this isn't something that you should try. But if it's a relatively dark scene or if it's a relatively low contrast scene, then this is definitely worth a try because you will be able to get out as much information as possible from this particular image. And this should also show you something else that is uh, very, very true with uh, the sensor linearity. And that is that when you have, uh, when you take an, a well-exposed image, and this is, this could actually be a well-exposed image, just keep in mind that you're taking all of these photons and capturing them in the lower end of, of, your, of what is possible for this sensor. And so you get, as a result, um, this, um, you're, you're dedicating the fewest amount of values uh, to all of this information that's provided to you. Um, but also, just to give you an idea, if you 
download, if you, if you take a photo in the raw format, you download that file onto your computer and you remove the tone curve, some pieces of software will actually allow you to view the raw linear information that comes out of that, out of that camera. It's going to look very, very dark. Um, and uh, the reason for that is you can imagine if we have a lot of the color information that's down in this sort of lower half and we look at it with this very linear, very flat tone curve, it will look very, very dark to us. It will, it will look like you have gotten rid of a lot of the details. And so by exposing to the right, um, you are able to recapture that information that you might have lost by underexposing uh, that particular scene. So exposed to the right, you get the most signal possible. You get the, the highest quantity of values, and it's generally a good thing unless you are already overexposing some pieces of information, then it's, it may not be such a good thing for you to do. And of course, when you download this file, uh, this raw file onto your computer, you then have to then underexpose. You have to take your, your exposure slider and slide it to the left ever so slightly to make the exposure proper again to how it should have actually appeared in the original, um, in the original scene. And with that, I thank you all for coming. And next week, we will uh, continue talking about um, digital cameras. <laughs>